first game I ever remember going to. You know, we all remember our first game, hopefully, or something very early in our yep. sports and particularly baseball experience. My first baseball experience that I can remember was going to a game with my family and it was Roberto Clemente night at Shea Stadium. What's up, that hat crew? Ed here. And on this episode, I give you guys the one and only Todd Radom. That's right. He was gracious enough to come on my podcast. It was awesome because we had a lot of fun about talking baseball, design, his book, uh, ugly uniforms. That's right. God, listen, there have been some really ugly uniforms throughout the year. Uh, there have been some ugly uniforms in, uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. Yeah, the, all of them. Every single sport. They all have at least one team with an ugly uniform. We talked about that. Uh, his process on when he designs, um, how he goes about it. And then we also talk about a wonderful logo, uh, the Wichita Wind Search. That's right, Eric. We talked about that one. So without further ado, guys, I give you the episode. Welcome back, guys, to yet another episode of the Data Chronicles. Obviously, you guys know I say this every time. My name is Ed. But guys, today I have a treat for you guys. I'm super excited. I have once you guys know who this person is, you'll know he has been around for a while and he's done some amazing work. My favorite one so far is the wind search, which is that wind search, the man, the one and only Todd Radom. How are you today, my friend? Ed, thank you so much. Great to see you. Happy, uh, happy almost holiday weekend, but I appreciate you having me on. Yeah. All right. We'll take care of this, you know, and then we'll go in and enjoy the weekend and have some fun. How's that? It sounds good to me. It's a good start to it all. I like it. I like it. All right. So let's, you know, let's dive in, my friend. Um, I I, I usually ask, you know, why, why did you become a fan of sports? Because you, you do a lot of work, you know, all over the sport, you know, spectrum, but like, you know, why, why sports? What, what made you gravitate towards that? Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting question. And, and I've been asked a lot of questions. I'm not sure anybody asked me exactly that. Um, so the beginning of it all, I always say that, you know, combining an interest in sports with what I do for a living is, um, it used to be really unique. It's not as unique as it used to be, but uh, the short story is I come from a very artistic family. Um, I've always been a sports fan, like, you know, people who are sports fans usually pick it up when we're young. And that was the case with me. And, um, anyway, you know, the thing about design for sports is the fact that, People really care about this stuff. As Just a little. By the fact, yeah, that we're talking here. And, you know, in 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 the uh, de design community, it used to be that sports was looked upon as kind of the dumpster diving of, of <laughs> design. It was not held in high esteem. So to work on things that people really care about, they wear these logos, they are tribal in their interests, people get tattoos of these logos – you know what I'm saying because we're talking the same language. Um, it 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 um, it it's it turned out to be a great thing to get into because it's so visible and yeah, there's scrutiny attached to it, but uh, the, the rewards are there as well. People do care about this, so um, yeah. I mean, I kind of got into design for sports before there was there was probably about three people doing it at that time, 30, 35 years ago. So here we are. Here we go, 2023, and you're still, you know, one of the top names out there. So, Thanks. you know, you must have been doing, you did something right, right? You picked the right uh, medium to start doing this. So why not, right? Well, sometimes it's, uh, sometimes the medium chooses you. Uh, sometimes it's luck being right place, right time. And I'm firmly convinced that, you know, a certain amount of fate was involved in all of this. And here we are, like I said, all roads lead to this very day. And uh, I do things that, don't have to do with sports, but the vast majority of what I do is sports related mm -hmm. and uh, and I love it. That's amazing. Also, you have a great collection of Chuck Taylors. You know, every time you show them off, I'm like, oh, man, this guy is, a, <laughs> you know, he's a man after my own heart right here. I love uh, it. You got to have some personal expression, right, Ed? You, you, you know, know it. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let me ask you, uh, and you said something very interesting, right, because I've always wanted to ask this, you, you know, as an artist, um, you, you know, when you get the accolades, everybody loves you and all that. And you're like, man, you're on cloud nine, right? Like you're amazing. 
I love this. What, how do you deal with like, let's say someone, you know, like they're like, oh, God, this thing is the ugliest ug logo there has been. You know, how do you deal with like a lot of those, the rejection side of, of, of being an artist? Well, a uh, couple of things. I'll go way back and think about being in art school. I went to school of visual arts in the 1980s and you would literally sit in a room and have your work critiqued. Yeah. And within the word critique is criticism, right? Yeah. I mean, so you could look at it two ways. It could be constructive or it could be a group of people in a circle, mm -hmm. you know, ganging up on you and criticizing you. So it starts there. So I've been doing it for a long time, to say the least. And, and I've been subjected to that dynamic for a long time as well. But secondly, you know, certainly in, in today's world where we have this tortured civic conversation people don't know how to act with each other people don't mm -hmm. you know I, I actually was talking about this last night with somebody uh, i am one of these people particularly on social media who you know you measure twice you cut once you think about what you're going to say and then you click that enter or send button and um you know we don't have a lot of that so i kind of come at it from a perspective of the fact okay people are just you know shooting from the hip over here they're not thinking about it and every once in a while, I do want to engage, which I really try not to because it's kind of pointless, yeah. usually, not to be condescending. No, it is. But, it is pointless. Yeah. I mean, it's point. Like, what are you going to do? It's it's kind of like I will say, well, listen, you know, there were considerations uh, that, that played out a, across a lot of people. It's never a unilateral decision what a designer wants to make, and they're going to make a, a pretty picture, and boom, it appears, um, you know, in the form of a team's logo. Um, so I always try to explain it when I do this, that there are a number of stakeholders involved, that it is a methodical process, mm -hmm. that it's not brain surgery. If you cut the uh, brain in the wrong place, the patient's going to die in that case. In this case, there are a lot of shades of gray. And then I come back to the fact that like, wow, you know, people really do care about it. I mean, that's, that's the big picture thing. And, uh, it's, it's, you know, believe me, I've heard it all over the years. <laughs> <laughs> right, you've been, you've been dragged through the mud on certain things, and like, oh, you know, this sucks, and this is not great. But you know, and and I always try to explain to people. And when I started my podcast, I really started to really understand that, like, there really is not one person a lot of the times that makes a decision on that design. There's a, like you said, there's a group of people that say, okay, yeah, we like this, but can you tweak this and can you tweak that? And at the end, you have the end result, and you know. Some people are going to like it, and then some people are not going to. So far, I have not really seen that many things that I have not liked, as you can see from the wall behind me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you're a positive guy. You have to, right? Especially, like you said, like social media can become a really dark place really quick if you're not really, if you let it, if you let it get to you, you know, in those those areas. So, well, and and really to that point, you know, there there are two sides to sports design. Of course, there are the hardcore fans who are fans of teams who will live and die with their teams every day, and then there are people who are into fashion and and uh, love logos. And you know, I mean, that that's gotten bigger and bigger. Um, particularly over the last few years mm -hmm. as as some of the looks of our headwear i'm looking behind you i have a bunch of you know it, it, you could be really a purist about this stuff but anyway the point is that there are uh, there's a broad cross section of humanity who is interested in this stuff whatever yeah. the case so you know you gotta and and anyway getting back to something you said just a minute ago there is there is always a, a slew of people who are involved in this process and and the you know sometimes it's an enormous group of people and i always liken it to you know that old expression about the sausage being made it's not pretty but hopefully at the end of the process it's tasty yeah and, and great analogy that's amazing it's, it's, <laughs> that's, that's a good analogy i've right used there. it once or twice and <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm 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 understating that i've used it hundreds of times yeah. because it's true and i've lived through it so uh you know, it, it's a meat grinder. It really can be. Yeah, it most certainly can. Let me ask you, and and obviously you've been asked this a thousand times, so I do apologize. But like, I want to get into the your process. You have a process, just like every artist has a process of design, right? Uh, I'm sure there are those initial conversations when someone reaches reaches out to you and say, "Hey, this is what we want to we want to do." And then you'll start having those conversations. But like, what is that process like for you as, you know, as Todd, the designer? 
Well, I mean, every job to me starts with me asking whoever is in charge of this, why? Why are you doing this? What is the point of this? Sometimes it's change for change sake, but more often than not, when we're talking about some big team rebrand, for example, um, teams rebrand for one of several very defined reasons. Uh, a team may have changed hands. They might have new ownership and that new owner might want to impart their own their own stamp on it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a team might want to break a cycle of losing. This happens very, very frequently. Sometimes a team will move into a new stadium or arena, and this provides a great opportunity to kind of, you know, get a new set of clothes and, you know, buy some new furniture. Look at it that way, right? It's all part yeah. of that. So you start with why, and then um, every job really starts with a very disciplined research process. So we never jump right into, or I never jump right into putting quote unquote pen to paper. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know why you're doing this. I want to know who your fan base is. I want to know what makes a fan of a team in Kansas City different from a fan of a team in Vancouver or New York or Miami. Um, and, you know, I've got preconceived notions about this, but sometimes you'll find out some surprising things that you never knew. And there are some fan bases in some cities that are more traditional. Um, if I were going to be asked tomorrow to redesign the Boston Red Sox, which I'm not being asked to do, or the New York Yankees, the Detroit Tigers, you're going to approach that in a very different way then you might um, the Arizona Diamondbacks or you know, Phoenix Coyote, Coyote, Arizona Coyotes or whoever it might be. Who <laughs> so, ends up being on that section because they don't even have a stadium, a place to play. Yeah, right exactly. Now. That's why I'm, that's what brought it to mind. And, you know, I'm like, okay, where are they going to be? So, uh, right. Anyway, it, it, it's, you know, it starts with research and knowing what you're getting into. And, and then, you know, among a part of this is, is making sure that you're not infringing upon someone else's look. If you were to give me um, the Boston College Eagles, well, I would surely have to look at the Philadelphia Eagles. I would have to look at every bird team out there. I would have to look at teams that are in Boston. So there's a lot of this stuff that goes into it. And then comes the fun part. I mean, the research is fun. I really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, not already does, but I really do. And then you kind of get into it. And to really just kind of like sew it up, there are, you know, you go in with a series of very well-defined concepts that are based on this empirical evidence that you've gathered up and then comes the sausage process. <laughs> the ugly part here comes, you know, like yeah. the side part. Yeah. And get ready because you know, <laughs> the, the fun stuff is all front ended and um, just navigating that process is a thing. Um, and you've got to be able to see it through it. It's, it's a marathon. Basically you can't lose steam at mile 40 or 24 and uh, you got to go, you know, run through the tape with with vigor and enthusiasm mm -hmm. and then you've got to wait because there's <laughs> always a period where it takes a little while for it to actually get out there you're like all right so here's like you know we just finished it we everything has been approved we're good to go now hurry up and wait yeah yeah and and a good example of that is a very um special logo that i did i can't even i won't even allude to what it is um, but uh, it's for a team, and it was finished well over a year ago in anticipation of 2024, and you almost forget about this. Oh and they're, they're probably going to be releasing it soon. And uh, I'm like, yeah, that's going to be kind of fun to see that. And I look back at what it was because, again, you kind of like your brain after a year of not really having looked at it. And uh, I can't wait to see what people say about it because I think that they're going to enjoy it. I am so excited. I'm pumped. I don't know what, what it is, but I'm pumped because like I've seen some of your work already. Like, I mean, like I said, you, you've done some amazing work. And actually, one of my favorite logos, and if I if I may say so, is like the, the rework that you did for the World Baseball Classic. Yeah, I mean, I was involved. I've been involved continually with World Baseball Classic since before it was a thing, which is oh. to say that uh, started out uh, discussions. I totally remember over a lunch in 2004 at the All-Star Game in Houston wow. in anticipation of the 2006 inaugural WBC. And, of course, all these years later, on the back you know, of what we just witnessed with this tournament, where it really kind of hit its stride and uh, came to fruition in a way that everyone imagined it would have come to fruition way back when. It was this buildup. Um, but I was there for the first finals, uh, Japan versus Cuba in San Diego in 2006. And uh, I love it. And it's so wonderful to see people all over the world embrace this thing, um, knowing that I've been 
a small part of it since the very beginning. Listen, as as someone who supports and is from you know Puerto Rico, the fact that like you know a, a tournament such as this has been you know put fandom right uh, yeah. in the forefront. That's what it is. Like you see, is like the excitement and the players buying in. It was an absolute just humongous success at least for me from my point of view was like you know free, seeing fans really engage into uh this tournament so yeah certainly and and you know where rico's gonna win it one of these tournaments. <laughs> they I mean, better win it one of these years there's my too God. much talent on that little Jesus. island there and and baseball history and all of it but uh yeah i mean you know again um i i was just in korea a couple of weeks ago too and had the opportunity to go to uh a Korean professional game. So this sport that is so familiar to you and I and millions and millions of other people, when you see something that's different about it, when it's played with a different kind of style, I mean, a good example I always talk about is the fact that I went to Cuba in the late 90s um, on a project. I had a permit from the U.S. Treasury Department, so it was all completely legal. It's a hard place to get to, obviously. Yeah. But to just watch a Cuban professional game at that time and see these guys warming up in the infield, throwing balls back and forth, like darts, oh. <laughs> no, no lazy throws from third to first. Um, no, like we're like, no we're, If you're going to practice, we're going to practice like we're playing. Yeah. 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 And, and maybe even a little more is like 120% <laughs> of capacity. So there is that, uh, there's a word for it, like Verdugo or, you know, like, right. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's like, Elon, uh, some, some, oh, yeah, it, awesome. it's, it's really, it is, it is absolutely awesome. So anyway, to have that kind of an opportunity to uh, work within the game on something that's a little bit different uh, and global in reach. Very, very, very cool thing. I hold the WBC very close to my heart. I hold it close to my heart. Like, you know, on our flags, you know, you know how, you know, we Puerto Ricans are, we put our flag on every single thing oh, you yeah. can think of. So, you know, the fact that you saw it and you saw the pride of like these other countries and the fact that like, you got to see the game from different countries aspects point of view, right? Like it was because U S we played, you know, they play different here in the U S and we do in Puerto Rico and Korea and China. So it's like very different and it's like very entertaining. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, it's all about preconceived notions to me, you know, you mm -hmm. could get lazy, all of us um, thinking that we know things that because we've seen things, right. However long we've been around for. And every <laughs> once in a while you see something that jolts you into, you know, paying attention to some degree a little yeah. bit more. And that would be the case with international baseball. And hey, I grew up in New York. So, you know, Puerto Rican community and the Puerto Rican baseball community uh, is is a, a force to be reckoned with. for sure. <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you you mentioned that flag and like, boom, there it is. There it so, is. There, you can't miss it. It's going to be there. <laughs> yeah. And, and and along those lines, I don't want to like uh, veer us uh, off course necessarily, but I always say that like one of the, you know, one of the things about getting older is, okay, there are parts of it which aren't necessarily great, but one of the things that is great is I'm of an age that, the first game I ever remember going to, you know, we all remember our first game, hopefully, mm -hmm. or something very early in our yep. sports and particularly baseball experience. My first baseball experience that I can remember was going to a game with my family and it was Roberto Clemente night at Shea Stadium in oh. 1971, where the Puerto Rican community of New York oh. honored the great one. And so uh, there was a Cadillac driven around the warning track to home plate. He is presented with a check for uh, some charitable endeavors that, you know, he was involved with so many of them. And uh, then he gets the game winning hit. And, um, you know, I remember it distinctly. I was seven years old. And I remember thinking like, wow, this guy's got to be pretty important to giving him this big car. And of course, we know how the story ends. Um, yeah. But uh, to, to have been able to see him perform in person on that particular night uh, was pretty special and very amazing. And what could have been that career? Yeah. What could have been, right? Oh, well, you know, he had it. He had a... Very long and fruitful career, and he was getting he toward the end. But he probably had another two, three years in the tank. He hits 3,000 3, hits on the nose. I actually just did a piece of art, which is on display um, at PNC Park in Pittsburgh, uh, commemorating his 3,000th hit. It's kind mm -hmm. of a, a uh, Puerto Rican, Latin American-influenced um, poster of the no. 70s with the Puerto Rican flag, and he's there in profile, you know, embodying all of that dignity. Um, but uh, think about what he could have done as a human being after his after his baseball career, as yep. much as he did 
he had an entire lifetime ahead of him um, of of good work and good deeds. And, you know, I know how fondly he's remembered every single day now, 50 years later. And that's my point, right? Like, I mean, yes, granted, he did amazing, you know, work on the field. But my thing is like, you know, what could have been like as far as the off the field, right? Like, you know, the humanitarian work that he did, like, you know, bringing pride to like, you know, a country such as ours, you know, in Puerto Rico, even here in the U.S., right? So that's like, you know, that's what I was like, you know, that life got cut short. However, because of that, though, there has been a lot of work, you know, because of, you know, he's been in, he's still... It's 2023 and he's still inspiring people. Yeah. That's the, how crazy it is. That's it. I mean, it's it's a legacy. And and I know that there have actually been serious conversations. It's not anything to laugh at of, of uh, him basically being nominated for sainthood. Right. Yeah. Nobody nobody is perfect. But you think about the life that the, the impact of that very short life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, you know, you, you cannot escape the way that he perished in yep. service to others um and anyway a, a mighty legacy so to you know to have done this piece of artwork to have done a couple of other things That's awesome involving him um and to again remember that first ever game that i remember um it's it's inspiring uh and and very cool i love it so let, let's you know let's go back a little bit to design because i really wanted to get a couple of, you know questions here do you look when you are doing the design when you're when you're when you're bring, you know when you're doing the whole process of everything do you look at you know how that logo would look on example like on a 5950 or a dad hat or whatever like do you you know is that something that you really look at and think about to make sure that it actually is aesthetically pleasing uh, on a on a hat yeah, I mean, so we call it activation ed. So mm-hmm. how does something activate and particularly in 2023 and beyond, yeah. uh, things have to activate in ways that they never had to, we never had to think about as designers 20, 30 <laughs> years ago, even 10 years ago, even five years ago, because technology changes so quickly. I always joke about the fact that, hey, when I started out, the big criteria was, what will it look like in black and white on a fax cover sheet, right? <laughs> and, and there are some people who are listening to this who have no idea what a fax machine is or can't even, pro- whatever. But, um, yeah, we will always uh, portray what it looks like in, um, you know, if it's a baseball logo, maybe in, you know, on the field of play in the context of an on-deck circle, ribbon boards, embroidery. Um, things get big. Things get small. They've got to be avatars. We're looking at things in our phones, which are yeah. teeny, teeny, tiny. We're looking at graphics, you know, getting gigantic. We're looking at graphics, uh, which are in the case of social media, which we talked about earlier, um, you know, a score bug or some kind of a, you know, something that's fleeting that's going to, mm-hmm. you know, the logo has to be really small and next to a number or some other messaging. So uh, it's different than it used to be, but, uh, and it's it's challenging, but yes, we do portray how all this stuff plays out uh, when it hits the real world. It's, it's so wild. Like, obviously, you know, and, and like you said, it's like, there's so many people now that like are fan of the sport. Yes. However, we look at collectors, right? Like, you know, how many people have thousands of hats? I mean, I'm nowhere near being a thousand hats, but like I have my own, you know, collection. It's like, I look at those logos and I'm like, man, that really looks great on that, with that color. That looks great with that brim, with the, you know, with the button on the top and all of that, the, the green under the bottom of the brim and things like that. Like, you know, to think about all of that, it's just, that is one of the coolest things, you know, as a job, right? That's to me, that's amazing. You know, you guys are yeah. killing it with that. I love that. Well, and that's a relatively recent thing, as you know, the, yeah. the, the influence and the size and the enthusiasm of what I'll call and everybody calls that knows about it. The hat community mm-hmm. um, has just blown up, particularly, you know, since the pandemic. Right. I mean, I think there were a lot of people who were home and decided to, you know, match their their kicks and their hats and drips and all of it. Yeah. And, and you know, it's it's really liberating. It's mm-hmm. it's a great, I, I love, you know, we've all got our go-tos, but, uh, you know, and, and hats are great because, you know, not everybody can wear an all orange outfit, let's say, but you can wear an orange hat or a powder blue hat or, you know, a neon green hat that I see behind you Yep, and uh, match it with your sneakers or not. Uh, Absolutely. And, and it's, like I said earlier, a little bit of personal expression and, uh, you know, and it, and it's liberating. And of course, there's the great story behind that. Spike Lee, 1996 World Series, asks New Era 
for a, a red Yankees hat to match his pupper coat while he's sitting at the World Series in Atlanta, and the rest is history. <laughs> uh, it's it's popular culture combined with street street culture, streetwear, licensing, and what's worn on the field for this very tasty mix. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question comment, like culture right like you know popular you know pop culture has really woven itself into sports that like you really cannot have a design without really thinking about how it is going to affect you know pop culture society going forward yeah and i mean this has been this way for a long time yeah uh think about you know think about the early days of particularly west coast rap where mm -hmm. you got you know dr dre and easy e wearing white Sox hats yep. right and just, you know, it's a good look. It tracks the Raiders, which who were in L.A. at that point, of course. Uh, and, you know, it influenced so many things. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's always, listen, every once in a while you'll see, you know, courtside in an NBA game, celebs wearing maybe an unlikely hat combination or an unlikely hat and logo combination. You know, like, where is this coming from? And people talk about it. And um, anyway, it it. It drives revenue for people who manufacture this stuff and keeps all of it interesting for people like you and I. Yeah, exactly. Keeps it fun. And I was like, oh, I guess I'm going to go buy a hat today. Here we go. <laughs> I like that hat. I don't know where it is. Which I did. It's, it's an addiction. To it's, you know, it's totally addictive. It really is. It, it literally happened to me. I was watching a baseball game. It was a uh, Guardians. Obviously, that's my team that I that I follow. Uh, but it was a uh, it was a hat that was like a blue with the red brim with the C on it. And I'm like, I couldn't find it anywhere online. I literally the next day call the team and I'm like, listen, I saw this hat on TV. Do you have it available? And sure enough, I was like, oh, yeah, we have it. I was like, here's my credit card. Send it to me right now. <laughs> and, it, it literally happened. And and how many Guardians hats do you have? Uh, well over 30. Well, OK, over well, there you go. I mean, so like you could you could potentially like cycle them if you were just going to do that. Cycle through them once a day, every month. And, you know, that's a I'll lot of looks. Yeah, exactly. It's the same thing here <laughs> with like the hats that I have. Like I have mm -hmm. enough to last me. I can wear one uh, for a day for a year straight and not wear the same one. <laughs> it's amazing. It's, it's, it's amazing. amazing. And you wouldn't have been able to say that not too long ago. And so, again, no. there's a range of opportunity for expression as either a fan or somebody who likes logos or it's just into fashion. There's something for everybody. So it's very inclusive and cool. Right. And it's and honestly, to me, it started like, you know, during a pandemic, like you said, it's like I'm going to support minor league baseball because these guys, you know, th the way they they make their money is on merchandising. So yeah. even if I buy one hat, at, at least that's something that's going to help them out, you know, yeah. one way or the other. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, some of the again, using the word expressive minor league looks um on field and off um yeah. are are there's just so much to choose from so yeah it's 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 always been great stuff and it continues to be regardless of what's going on on the field in the minors and structurally you know that's a great segue by the way so i'm going to ask you because you did a design for you know one of the best logos out there in minor league baseball the wind surge um like what was that that process with the with the minor league team? I mean, because it's different, right? It's a, it's a totally different uh, style than a lot of minor leagues. You know what the what we look at. You know, fun, quirky minor league uh, logos nowadays. Yeah, and that is really it. Begins uh, with with the late owner of the Wichita Wind Surge, Lou Schweckheimer. So Lou, who I just can't say enough good things about. Um, I designed a sleeve patch. Mm -hmm. uh, in his memory and right behind my monitor over here, about mm -hmm. eight inches behind what I'm looking at of you is a sleep patch of Lou. So he kind of looks over me every day here. Um, but, uh, Lou Schweckheimer, uh, baseball lifer for people who are not familiar with him. Mm -hmm. He uh, started out as an intern with the Pawtucket Red Sox. He was a Rhode Island guy and he worked his way up and basically became the owner of a couple of major league or minor league franchises. Um, and just a delightful, wonderful human being. So uh, I had known him for a long time. He reached out to me. The Wichita Wind Surge were previously the New Orleans baby cakes. Mm -hmm. And they were just not, things were not in New Orleans are not working out. So he said, we're going to do a, a look for Wichita. Wichita is the 50th biggest city in America. A little surprising. Talk about doing your research and finding yeah. things out that might you know, you wouldn't have known otherwise. And his concept was, he said, I want to hire somebody who is, you know, essentially a major league designer 
to do a major league look for a minor league club. This should be uh, solid. You know, we've done silly. Uh, we want to do something that is maybe a little more serious in tone. You could look at it that way. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a process. It was an amazing process uh, it involved, you know, touring their ballpark as it was under construction, visiting the city uh, for the announcement of, of the name and colors. And uh, it was a fun process and there were a lot of pieces to it. And, uh, you know, the, the sad part is that Lou passed away of COVID in the early days of the pandemic and never got to see his dream come to fruition um, in terms of just being in a game there um, and seeing this look on the field. But everything that that job was all about, again, starts with Lou. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I love it. Uh, it's a good look. Um, the team was recently sold, so we'll see if they stick with it. I have no idea, <laughs> but uh, but but I like it. It's very aspirational. It is a Pegasus ascending to the heavens, um, you know, propelled by you know the winds of the plains, and the colors have some symbolism. And anyway, it was a really fun project, and I look back at it very fondly. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about the Pegasus, like the 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 meaning behind the Pegasus on for the logo. Because I mean, like I said, it's it pops, like the the logo pops. It really does. And like you were saying, you know, those are the things that you think about when you are making a design. It's like, is it going to portray, you know, very well on a hat or like you said on a phone? Like you know, like we have our small phones. This is what we use every day. It's a computer, supercomputer, right? So yeah, yeah it, how is it going to look in that? Well, that's it. And, and you know, as I said before, and you totally get, like we as consumers, our, 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 our uh, attention spans are yep. nothing, right? <laughs> so right. if you think about, think about the Wind Surge primary logo, which is, you know, the Pegasus ascending and it's got yep. a W behind it. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's, you could peel those pieces apart and still have something that's proprietary. And when you look at it teeny, 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 tiny on your screen on, you know, and you're going to look at a score bug, as I said before. Yep. Um, it's going to look like it should look. Um, mm -hmm. And if a logo fails that test, you know, and again, we're talking 2023 20, and beyond. And yep. this is, this is like, this is what we got. It's got to be able to succeed in that context. It, you're right. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Let me ask you, I've asked this one person one uh, before, but you as a, as an artist and a designer, do you have a list of like names and and designs that are like you know that could potentially eventually be used in in certain uh projects in in the future do you keep a list uh for yourself no no usually that i mean i've been involved with that stuff many times but mm -hmm. uh that's usually not my lane mm -hmm. um and let's face it you know um a lot of the projects i work on are existing teams yeah. redos of existing teams redesigns and so like that. yeah and and you know part of the part of the reason as you well know and many of your listeners know for mm -hmm. some of the more uh i don't know it depends on how you look at it fun outrageous outlandish mm -hmm. you know um whatever you want to call it names of minor league teams is because it's hard to secure a trademark and so mm -hmm. when you start combining two unlikely names and you get something really unique uh, you can run with it, but no, I don't usually maintain that kind of thing. I'll get involved with it, like I said, but yeah, not at the top of my uh, of of my uh, of my list. That's awesome, though. I mean, I, the fact that you're like, nope, nope, we're gonna go ahead and like based on design and beside, obviously, you know, trademarking has become such a big, huge part of you know design now. You cannot do anything as like because then you're gonna be like, oh, I'm getting sued for this or that because the name or the logo is ve portrays very closely to something else. Yeah, you got to really be careful with it. And even to the point that there are, you know, small elements that you may be inspired by. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's the eye of a bird that's depicted on a certain logo. Well, you know, I mean, it, me, I, I'm I'm going to look at that and say, well, you know, this looks way too close to this. Yeah. I got to I got to I got to pull back and do something else. So being mindful of that. You no, know, we all have lawyers in our lives and some of, of them course we, we love and their friends are. <laughs> Thousands or whatever they might be, but uh, cease and desist letters are no good for anybody. Are never fun. Absolutely <laughs> not. Um, okay. So uh, is there a a particular um, decade in that that uh, inspires your your artistic, you know, 
frame or like, you know, it was like 40, 50, 60, 70. It's like, you know, is there a specific decade that you're like, this is where a lot of my inspiration comes from? What a great question. Uh, the answer would be, I like, sometimes I feel like I'm a time traveler because I'll borrow yeah. from all these things. I kind of love it. I love all that foo-foo 1870s, you know, crazy lettering with, you know, yeah. not necessarily built for today. But there are some pieces of that that are very, uh, you know, like like uh, just, again, ebullient, expressive, whatever you want to say that you can mm -hmm. position for today. Art Deco, you know, the 1930s, late 1920s, early 30s, very streamlined, a lot of symmetry, you know, very kind of built for sports logos in a lot of ways. And then, you know, the 50s aesthetic, which is, you know, Sputnik and, you know, yeah. all this boogie looking stuff kind of cool and yeah so being able to borrow all of these things from different eras uh is something that i like to do um and you know one of the things one of the projects i've been involved with for years and years is uh cooperstown collection for mlb and mm -hmm. uh, we don't really create theme art anymore but you know creating a logo that might stand in for the 1957 milwaukee braves or the you know 55 dodgers or the 1942 St. Louis Cardinals or the 27 Yankees building a piece of art uh, that could be applied to merchandise right. that celebrates these teams. That's just not a Yankees logo um, is something I've always done. So there's that research again, research into what these graphics look like yeah. and how to borrow from the best of that and create something original that, that tips your hat to it. I love it. Right, I have one last question for you, and then I uh, will get into the fun part of this uh, work. Um, but you know, we I, I mentioned this early in the beginning of the the episode is you did a work, you know, uh, the book, you know, winning ugly. You know, what inspired you to say, you know, I think this would be cool. Obviously, it is cool. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Uh, but like what inspired you to say, you know, like, let's let's put something together uh, in, you know, during this time period where like, you know, there were some interesting choices in <laughs> uniforms. Let's just say that. <laughs> yeah. And, and actually, it is a great story. I'm glad you asked. Um, and and uh, like all great stories, it begins at JFK Airport in New York. So <laughs> in all seriousness, I'm sitting at JFK Airport in New York at night waiting to board a flight to Rome. And this is in the spring of 2017. So sitting there, you know, you, you, you sit in the airport lounge and uh you know you're you're looking at your email one last time before you're going to be trapped in a metal tube for a number of hours because yeah, right. i never look at my phone on my when i'm flying but anyway um and i get an email from an editor at the new york times asking if i would be interested in writing an op-ed an, an editorial essay about ugly baseball uniforms and the draw of them and I thought, wow, this is, first of all, it's the New York Times asking me to write an, an, an editorial piece. Right. You know, it's it's like, wow, that's pretty amazing. And um, of course, the answer is yes. But yeah, then what do you yeah. say about them? What do you say about them? And I always say that that I am a product of the 1970s. I grew up in the New York area in the 1970s, um, you know, lived in the city in the 80s. Um, but, you know, this was this era where a lot of things are coming together for sports. There are alternate leagues. There's the ABA in basketball and the WHA in, in um, hockey, WFL in football. There are expansion teams. The Blue Jays and the Mariners are born at this moment uh, in 1977 in MLB. And uniforms are changing, right? Society is changing. I have a quote in the book from the manager of the Atlanta Braves who, who says, you know, he says, well, you know, our uniforms are different than they were three years ago. He said this in 1972. He says, the clothes I wear, are different than they were three years ago. So this is a time where, where uh, you know, look at a picture of the Beatles, for instance, in 1964, and then look what they looked like in 1967. So why should sports not track that? Right. And part of it was really ugly. The 70s are the weirdest decade. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it gave birth to all kinds of strange things. And um, anyway, our, our sports clothing reflects that. And of course, it's going to be a book um, because you can really expand upon this in a way that talks about the history of the baseball uniform um, in general and then focuses in, in, a, in a loving way on some of those more questionable uniforms. <laughs> it, they were some ugly ones. I was just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> they were... 
Oh yeah, and and you know I I say it in there, you know, in winning ugly, ugly is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, True. At one time, I I had a pet bulldog, and uh, I'd walk down the street, and I remember people, various people, I've heard this more than once, look at her and say, "She's so ugly, she's beautiful." Now, what does that mean? Right? <laughs> right. Ugly dogs can be beautiful. Ugly Christmas sweaters can be charming. Uh, ugly ugly baseball is a uniform thing now too. That's a crazy thing. Yeah, so there you have it. So there is there is something to uh, embrace, some meat on the bones, and something to expand upon. <laughs> it's so ugly, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's, like, it's so ugly, it's beautiful. And come on, Ed, like people are somewhere, somebody, they may not be saying exactly that, but they're thinking that about the oh, 1978 yeah. San Diego Padres or the you know famous Houston Astros tequila sunrise uniforms, whatever. And which is crazy because both of them are like, you know, very popular right now in 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 design and, and baseball. Yeah, they don't look like anything else. I I I had some questions yesterday. Um, as we are recording this, the Denver Nuggets are about to go to the NBA mm-hmm. finals for the first time in their history. And I had a um a uh, news outfit in Denver interviewing me about the uh, Denver Nuggets, you know, skyline uniforms, seven colors, looks like Tetris. 1982 <laughs> right but like there's nothing else that looks like that and you no. can imitate that but like somebody's gonna, everyone is gonna say anybody who knows about it is gonna oh that's the denver you know often imitated never duplicated and then you know let's not forget you know uh the uh the miserable the 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 logo that you put on your instagram of the denver nuggets with the yeah. guy with the axe pick and the basketball i mean maxi minor yeah i mean yeah. come on that's amazing yeah you'd never do that today where we take ourselves way too seriously and you know it's almost like in, in a very larger sense you know um hey, i'm yeah. not even gonna get into it it's like the logos to go through focus groups we can sometimes overthink this you know, but something as joyous and pure and kind of like poorly drawn as that would never, ever happen today. And there's a charm and organic nature to it that's very refreshing. You're right. And, you know, I always say this. We as human beings, we like to complicate the bologna sandwich way too much. <laughs> it's true. You know, like I'm one of these people that like, you know, what do you want on your pizza? Just give me a piece of pizza. Like if it's a, piece a slice, of pizza, there's nothing better than good ingredients. You know, you can, you know, too, too, too many ingredients can spoil the meal. And uh, 100%. Absolutely right. Yep. Love it. All right. You know what? This is, I, I love this conversation. This is great. All right, my friend, are you ready? I am ready. All right. So you go to the ballpark. I usually ask, you know, what's your food and drink of choice? So I'm going to ask you that one, but I also want you to tell me what is the very first thing you do when you go into a ballpark? Like, you know, what is the very first thing? Do you go to your to your seat? Do you go to the, the team store? What is the first thing that you do when you go into a ballpark? Well, I'll tell you what, Ed, things have changed this year because of the pitch clock and the game has moved so quickly <laughs> that my strategy has really changed. So I'll give you an example. I had a friend in from out of town a couple of weeks ago. Uh, went to a game, uh, and um, but this is what I've always done. I love to get there really early. Mm-hmm. Depends on who you're with. Not everybody likes to sit there and watch batting practice. I want to walk around the whole place. I want to get a sense of place, even if I've been there a million times. I want to grab a beer, especially if the weather's nice, and enjoy looking at the grass, looking at you know people watching, soaking in some mm-hmm. locality if it's possible. Um, so that's the first thing that I will do. I want a good long walk. Give me a half an hour, stretch the legs. Yeah. Cause then you're going to sit down because you can't look away. The time yeah, the exactly. Time. Right. You got to be focused. <laughs> it's true. It's great for TV. <laughs> not so much for attending. I'll, I'll give, I'll give people that one. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Just real quick. I went to a game, another game, um, uh, about three weeks ago and, uh, had great seats, went with great friends. We're talking the whole while. And like, all of a sudden it's the seventh inning. It's like, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> right. It is. Yeah. Has, 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 has baseball become a, um, for you, not just a sporting event, but like a social event. Oh, without question. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No question. I mean, it's kind of always been, mm-hmm. um, I have a core group of college buddies that we used to, uh, we would rent a car in, Jersey in the eighties and like drive to Chicago for a weekend and hit a white Sox game, Cubs game, a Tigers game, you know, pirates game on the way back, this kind of thing. And it was really hard to do then because it was before there was an internet. We had to like get USA today and, and uh, look at the schedule for the next month and say, Hey, we could do this. And uh, (laughs) we would get a bag of bologna sandwiches and put it in the back of the car and 
and uh yeah, off we and, go and, yeah and off we go exactly so anyway that 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 feeling of um sports your sports experience being um tied in with being sociable has always been something for me and so many people and of course you reach a certain point in life that you're gonna like uh look back at certain games and think about people who are no longer with us um or you know mm -hmm. have moved away or you haven't seen in a while or whatever and um i always think that way i love that love that all right let's see here if you had to choose one one okay what will be your favorite fruit? Oh, well, it's funny you say that because I just had breakfast and I crush about a quarter pound of fruit, maybe a half I, every morning. Uh, I, I, but, but anyway, you know, mixed fruit, but oranges without oh. question. I am an orange fan. I like the color orange, as you said before, but uh, I think, but uh, I, I like a good orange. I love that. Love that. Okay. <laughs> uh, Let's tie a little bit because you know we talked about this with about pizza, but do you think that pineapple belongs on a pizza? No, I mean I'm, <laughs> I no, I'm I'm again I'm a New Yorker and I'm gonna so like just, cheese or pepperoni be done with it. Let's go. Yeah, Let's not complicate maybe it. maybe some you know uh, maybe some ground beef, but um, but Ooh, I okay. you know but but like it I, I will acknowledge the fact that it's an unlikely good combination, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like savory and like all that. But just reflexively, I'll say, come on now. <laughs> come on now. What let's are we not, doing? Let's not mess this up. Please, Listen, let's go. Yeah, you know. But if it were put in front of me, it wouldn't be my first choice. But it's not outlandish. If, I, if I'm hungry, I'm hungry. I'm going to eat it. But I won't, yeah. it's not something that I would pick. I'm Truth. with you there. Okay. What would be your superpower? If you were to have a wanted to, if you were to have a choice out of superpower, what would be your superpower? Mind reading, mind oh. reading. Imagine me sitting there, you know, about to embark <laughs> upon a logo for a baseball. It's like, hey, we've gone through seven sets of revisions. What do you want? What, what is it that you want? <laughs> just, just say it already. So I can oh, do, I like, read your mind. And I could actually make a logo of what that would look like. It would be like beams shooting out <laughs> of my eyes, directly penetrating the, the chest cavity of, of a client. I think that's amazing. <laughs> I love it. All right. What was your... Uh, go on that uh, uh, tangent. Like, what was your favorite superhero, or still is your favorite superhero? I don't know. I was never a comic book kid necessarily. I really uh -huh. wasn't. Uh, you know, so there really is not one to be candid that stands out. I like it. I can yeah. understand that. Yeah. All right. If you were to choose between these two smells, fresh cut grass, or a uh, bread bacon in the oven. Oh man, they're both great. They're both great. Oh like, yeah, and I like you know. Tell you just a couple of weeks ago, I'm like walking around. I live in a city now, and mm -hmm. and and uh, you know, you don't often smell cut, fresh cut grass. It's so nice, especially this time of year. It is. Um, I'm gonna say, you know, there is like bread baking in the oven is just yeah. You walk by a bakery, oh, oh, totally. I'm like I'm drooling, Ed. I'm like I'm thinking about there used to be. I lived for 13 years in Hoboken, New Jersey, and there was a place called the Antique Bakery. I think it's still there. But they were baking these like, you know, semolina loaves at yeah. two in the morning when I'm coming home from going out with my friends. And I'd stop in there and I'd get like a 50 cent loaf and just oh. crush it, you know? Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> oh, that just sounds good right now. Oh, Absolutely. Right? Heck yeah. Uh, all right. A couple more and then I promise I will leave you alone, my friend. But what was the weirdest thing you've ever eaten? Oh, I, I will admit to being not the most adventurous eater in the world. Uh huh. Um, so I would really have to think about that. And if I think about it, I might have like, you know, no, I, I no, I'm not going there because it's like, I wouldn't do that. I'm not, I admit <laughs> I am like, I am not an adventurous eater. I've got, no. I've got, no, no, no. I've got, you know, my wife telling me a story about going to Mexico city with some clients and eating ant eggs or, you know, I've just never <laughs> been put in that position. You're like, I'm not going to be put in that position because I'm never going to do it. Just don't yeah, even bother. It's like, you know, I've had like bizarre meats, you know, a little bit. Yeah. All right. All right. I got one for you. Uh, I, I had a yak burger about three years ago. A yak burger. A yak burger. Wow. Okay. Yeah. How was yeah. it though? Uh, it was a little gamey, a little uh, bit yeah. dry. Um, yeah. but uh, but yeah, I did have a yak burger, and um, it was at a. <laughs> I'm gonna give a shout out. It's it was at a place in Jersey City, New Jersey, called Dark Side of the Moo, and they had <laughs> exotic, weird, 
<laughs> meets my my oldest daughter took me there for Father's Day. How's that for a good Father's Day present? That is a that's a dad. Great I'm gonna buy you a yak burger. Like that. Here we go. Happy yeah. Father's Day. Here's a yak burger. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. All right, last one here. Okay, um, if you could take just one thing to a, a deserted island, you know you're 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 heading there. There's no choice. You're going. But if you could take one thing to your deserted island, what would it be? Question, Ed, do I have Wi-Fi there? <laughs> oh, good <laughs> question. No one has asked that question. It's like, because if there's Wi-Fi, there's my phone. Here I go. Yeah. Well, so, all right. Regardless, uh, I, I am a reader and uh, I would probably take my iPad, which already has a few hundred books stored on it mm -hmm. that doesn't rely upon Wi-Fi. So if you're going to say, like, are you taking a family member or your pet or something like that? That's a different story. Yeah. But uh, I would probably I would probably take my iPad. It's sitting right here plugged in in front of me with a few hundred books in it. And um, yeah, I would yeah. I would I would be able to bide the time. My mine is plugged in right now. Exactly. Oh, look at you. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's a great looking notebook. No, I love it. Right. I, could, I, I found Old it school, composition like, marble. Yeah, notebook. Exactly. So I've got a couple of them myself. There you go. Todd, thank you so much for doing this. I've had an absolute blast. I had a lot of fun. Thank you for doing this. I'm going to ask you, where can people find you on uh, on the socials, my friend? Very easy. Uh, Instagram, Twitter, primarily. It's at Todd Radom, T-O-D-D-R-A-D-O-M. And uh, that's the gateway to everything. So I cannot thank you enough, Ed. It's been a great conversation. Could have gone on for another hour. Maybe Absolutely. we'll do it again sometime. We, we will. We will certainly will. I want to hold you to that, my friend. Thank you so All much. Right. Thank you. Great seeing you. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode with Todd. Now, make sure you guys are following him if you aren't, if you're not doing that already. And if you're not, why? So make sure you do that right now. Actually, just wait to the end of the episode. You hear the dad joke and then you go and follow him. All right. Go and do that. Uh, thousand thanks to Todd it was a it, it was a, it was a ton of fun I, I learned a lot from him obviously and um I couldn't say nicer things about the man so uh make sure you guys are following him seriously uh follow the podcast uh I'm on uh Instagram Twitter threads I don't know I'll probably be on the next new social media platform out there as well so um but yeah give it five stars give give the uh give the five the podcast five stars there you go all right, and now for the dad joke of the episode, and here it is. What is sticky and brown? Duh, a stick. All right, all right, I see myself out. And until then, guys, keep on grinding. And always, Super to Minor Leagues. See ya.